Hi, I'm Irene Ma from the University of Calgary Internal Medicine Point of Care Ultrasound Program. I'm here to talk about pneumothorax today. I have no financial conflicts of interest in relation to this presentation. This is the outline of the talk. We're going to go over basic principles, relevant findings, fake outs and pitfall, and an algorithm for evaluating pneumothorax. So let's start with the basic principles. The first one relates to the findings present at the site of incination. The second one, we're going to go over what findings are typical of pneumothorax, but not diagnostic. Thirdly, findings that will rule out pneumothorax. Fourth, findings that are highly suggestive of pneumothorax. And lastly, a plug for clinical integration. So let's start with uh, principle number one findings we're going to be talking about today apply only to the site of incination. That is where your transducer is on the patient's chest. That's really what findings you are limited to concluding about. So in a supine patient, air is most likely to be located in the least gravitational dependent area. And so that's highlighted in blue. Again, that's in a supine patient. And this doesn't apply to loculated, localized, or septated pneumothoraces. So now if you're scanning where X is and you find no presence of pneumothorax, your findings really only to apply to that site right there. So the bottom line is the more areas you scan, screen and scan, the more confident you are about your findings. So in general, in a supine patient, we should be scanning from the clavicle down to the liver on the patient's right hand side and clavicle to all the way down to the heart on the patient's left hand side. The second principle, what are some classic findings of pneumothorax? And these are really classic, but they're not considered diagnostic. And again, this really uh, these findings only apply at the site of uh, insulation. So here's a classic um, patient, uh, findings of a patient with pneumothorax of the lung where you see no evidence of lung sliding, and this is the pleural line right here. There's no evidence of sliding, and, um, and there's presence of A-lines as illustrated here and here. There are a number of findings that will help you rule out the presence of pneumothorax at the site of insulation. And here's an example of um, uh, presence of lung sliding. And again, this is a rib, line, rib here, rib there, and this is a pleural line. You can see the movement and the sliding. And when it's easily seen, um, it's, it's easy to rule out pneumothorax at that site. However, lung sliding is sometimes really challenging to see, especially at the lung apices, where there's very little minimal vertical sliding that occurs at that site. Here's another example where pleural line is seen right here, and it's a little bit hard to tell whether or not the, there is any evidence of lung sliding. However, decreasing the depth can then allow you to visualize that lung sliding movement a little bit better. So that comes to the first troubleshooting maneuver, decreasing depth. So unless you can readily see lung sliding in a clip with a lot of depth, if there's any doubt at all, decrease the depth. If you still have trouble visualizing, the second troubleshooting maneuver could involve switching to a linear transducer. So here's an example of a patient with clear lung sliding that's readily visualized with a linear transducer. Compared with this one, a clip of a patient with pneumothorax, there's no sliding that's visualized here. There's a third troubleshooting maneuver. If you have trouble appreciating if there's sliding or no sliding, you can use M mode. The sliding movement is brought out by the M mode. So the, the way M mode works is that this is the line 
and the, ultras uh, the ultrasound machine visualizes and records only findings on this line over time. So the x-axis here is over time. So what the ultrasound machine is doing is like looking, visualizing at this area over time. And you can appreciate that uh, this line here refers to this white line, which is the plural line. And again, this is the A line here, A line there. So what you're seeing here is that as there's lung sliding, it brings out that movement deep to the pleura. So then what you see is what we call a seashore sign, where above the pleura, there's very still sea, where the muscle movement is not moving a whole lot. Uh, and deep to the pleural line is a sandy appearance. And again, this is called the seashore sign. The seashore sign indicates the presence of lung sliding. And again, lung sliding will then rule out the presence of pneumothorax at that site. This slide shows you the presence of um, what we called a barcode sign, where there is absent lung sliding. And again, on M mode here, what you see is this this line refers to this plural line, and you see this absent movement all across, uh, both above and below the pleura. And this is termed the barcode sign or the stratosphere sign. This barcode uh, or stratosphere sign indicates the absence of lung sliding. If you still can't tell, there's the possibility of using Doppler. On this clip on the left here, you can see a linear transducer where the movement of the pleura is highlighted uh, by the color Doppler. On the right here is using a curvilinear probe where the movement uh, of the pleura and movement deep to the pleura is highlighted by the, uh, by the color Doppler as seen on this slide. So in summary, there are a number of findings that will rule out pneumothorax. The most uh, useful one is the lung sliding. And if you have trouble visualizing lung sliding, you can decrease the depth, use a linear transducer, use M mode or Doppler. Now we'll go over the two other findings that will rule out pneumothorax for you. The second one is the presence of beelines. So B lines are hyperechoic vertical lines that are composed of multiple horizontal uh, reverberation artifacts. Um, you're welcome to watch our B line video for in additional information on what B lines are. But in short, B lines are thought to be arising from the thickened interlobular septal lines as shown in green here. So these are reverberation artifacts that arise from these septa. And it stands to reason that if you have a layer of air between the parietal and visceral pleura, no amount of thickening can be visualized by the ultrasound transducer because the air here will reflect all the uh, transducer sound waves back. So another finding that will uh, rule out to pneumothorax is the presence of a lung pulse. What you can see here is not the same as lung sliding. Um, what you're seeing here are rhythmic patterns and rhythmic movement uh, of the lung um, as heart sounds and heart uh, pulsations are transmitted to the pleura. You can capture the same finding using M mode. And here again, here's the pleural line. And what you're seeing is are these rhythmic patterns uh, beneath the pleura um, or they're beneath the plural line that are picked up. And again, the regular rhythmic uh, properties of these uh, will indicate that these are lung pulses. Again, stands to reason that if, you're, if there's a layer of air between your parietal and visceral pleura, no amount of pulsations that are transmitted to the visceral pleura could be visualized. And therefore, visualization of these rhythmic um, movements suggest that there is no air between the two layers. So in short, these are the three findings that if they're present, will rule out pneumothorax. Number one, lung sliding, two, B lines, and three, lung pulse. Just a word of caution though. 
the reverse of this isn't true, meaning that uh, the absence of lung sliding and no beelines and no lung pose does not mean the patient definitively has pneumothorax. There is a differential diagnosis, for example, of a lung not sliding. Pneumothorax is only one. In a patient who's not breathing, there will be no sliding. In a large boli, in a lung boli, in, uh, will not have any sliding. If there's right mainstem intubation, you will not see lung sliding on the left-hand side. Or if the pleural, pleural layers are adhed, uh, have adhesions for whatever reasons, be it uh, pleurodesis, fibrosis, or any other kinds of adhesions. Very large atelectasis, atelectasis and consolidation can also result in a lung sliding, although uh, these will definitely, in general, have findings deep to the pleura. That's not just A-lines. And lastly, if you have any upper airway obstruction such that no air is going into the lung, uh, lungs will not slide. There is one sliding that is thought to be highly suggestive of pneumothorax. In fact, when it was first written up, in, um, it was uh, felt to be pathognomonic, and that is this finding of um, lung sliding on one side and absent of lung sliding on another side term the lung point. How the lung point arises, um, let's imagine that you have a patient with pneumothorax as indicated uh, in this area here. If you're scanning the patient uh, in the anterior chest region, what you're going to get is the barcode or stratosphere sign. If you're scanning the patient laterally and posteriorly in this area here, what you'll see on lung ultrasound is the seashore sign. However, if you happen to catch it right at the time, uh, right at the junction between lung that is normal and the start of the pneumothorax, what you might then see is the presence of lung sliding on one side and the absence of, absence of lung sliding on the other side. You can again capture the same thing on M-mode imaging, where here you intermittently along this line uh, that M-mode is reading, you intermittently get sliding and no sliding. So here what you'll see is that um, during as the lung slides in, you get what looks like a seashore sign locally here. And then as the lung slides back away, there is the barcode sign. and again, seashore as the lung slides back in again. So you get this intermittent pattern of um, seashore with barcode findings. One tip I would suggest is really consider your transducer orientation. While most things in lung ultrasound, we do start with the transducer marker to the patient's head. Um, if you're looking for lung point, however, uh, keeping in that orientation, if the pneumothorax is shaped as in blue there, uh, sometimes would look very confusing. If, however, instead you rearrange your transducer, rotate it so that you have the uh, transducer in a transverse um, orientation, you can then follow and find a lung point easier where there is sliding on one side and absent of sliding on the other side. Using this, using transducer to sequentially map out areas can give you an idea of the size of the pneumothorax. So in this case, if the lung point is located um, relatively anteriorly, you can, give you, you can give you an idea about the size of the pneumothorax. On the other hand, if you're finding the lung point way out laterally or in, even in the posterior axillary line, um, it is uh, suggestive of a very large uh, pneumothorax. And therefore, tracing this border is extremely helpful in estimating the size of the pneumothorax. And lastly, the plug for the importance of clinical integration. Your pretest probability means a whole lot. So in a patient who is otherwise healthy uh, but is symptomatic after chest trauma, uh, this is absence of lung sliding is highly um, uh, suggestive of a pneumothorax. 
In another scenario, if you have a patient who had lung sliding before you put in a central line and lost the lung sliding right after you put in the central line, again, that would be highly suggestive of a pneumothorax. However, in cases of uh, patients with uh, pulmonary uh, lung bullae, um, it, absence of sliding in these regions would probably not mean a whole lot. It's really important to understand what are potential other fake outs and pitfalls. We've already alluded to some of these, but what are additional ones that you need to be aware of? Sometimes learners look at uh, lung point and think of it as something that looks different from one side to the other. So here, yes, they're sliding here, it looks different here, but we have, what you're seeing here is actually the diaphragm and liver deep to that. So what you're seeing here is the liver lung point, which sometimes can be mistaken for a lung point. This is an example of uh, the heart-lung interface, where again, you see this heart um, as a, uh, and the lung on the left-hand side and the heart on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, so don't be fooled by that. They don't, uh, the heart-lung interface, uh, A, the heart would be beating, and B, the heart-lung interface tends to have a little bit of a distance. So there's a bit of a step off uh, from the level of the lung pleura. So the third pitfall has to do with interpretation of M modes, uh, images. Well, the textbooks tend to show you a classic image like that. And again, if you kind of walk back through, this is the plural line illustrated by red here. The classic textbook image will have the seashore sign where the sea is perfectly still like a barcode itself when the shore is, is um, either sandy or have, has rhythmic patterns that indicate uh, a lung pulse. Unfortunately, in real life, um, you don't tend to get uh, complete stillness above the pleural line. So in, especially in patients with pneumothorax, here's an example of a patient with pneumothorax, and you can see that there's a fair amount of muscle movement in the intercostal muscle region, and therefore don't, you, you wouldn't necessarily expect complete stillness in this region. Here's an example of a patient uh, without pneumothorax. So this is a normal seashore sign. You will, you definitely do see the regular, uh, the, the sandiness beneath the pleural line. But what you will also see is that above the pleura, you may see some movement uh, as well. So sometimes in a patient with a lot of respiratory distress, the movement above the pleural line can make M-mode interpretation a bit challenging. Speaking of movement, if you are, if the uh, sonographer has a lot of movement, that movement will also transmit to uh, the patient's muscles and, and, um, and result in a pattern that is uh, essentially uh, impossible to interpret. So this is a, uh, showing tremors or, or deliberate movement uh, in the hand of the sonographer resulting in uh, an uninterpretable image. So the tip here um, is either limit your caffeine consumption or do your best to hold very still when this is happening because the patient uh, inherently will also introduce movement uh, with his, his or her respiratory efforts. So here's an example of a patient uh, who does have pneumothorax. And, um, and again, you can see that some of the respiratory movements uh, can be seen uh, both above and below the pleura. Lastly, in patients with subcutaneous emphysema, um, it would be impossible to conclude or to evaluate also for the presence of uh, pneumothorax because the layer of air accumulating in the soft tissue uh, precludes any conclusion uh, of findings deep to this layer of, uh, of air here. Uh, clue to um, seeing a subcutaneous emphysema is a complete loss of Landmark, so you can't really see where the, the rib margins are 
Um, and this is a patient with uh, subcutaneous emphysema. So I'm going to conclude with a uh, uh, quick uh, algorithm on and a summary of how to evaluate for pneumothorax. The first question we tend to ask is, is there a presence of lung sliding? If lung sliding is present, you can confidently say that there is no pneumothorax at the site of insulation. If, however, you don't see lung sliding, your next question should be, are there beelines or lung posts, both of which, the presence of which, will rule out the pneumothorax at that site of insulation. If, however, you don't see beelines, lung pouse, or lung sliding, your next uh, question, obviously, if there is time to do so in, in a critical resuscitation scenario, you may not have time to do this. Uh, but if there's time, uh, look for the presence of lung point. And if lung point is present, um, it, and again, given the right clinical scenario, it would be highly suggestive of the presence of pneumothorax. Absence of lung point, however, does also have a differential. It's possible that the lung point is hiding beneath um, a rib or beneath in an area that you can't actually see, um, or uh, there are uh, potentially differential for lung points as well. Large bully or very bad COPD potentially can also uh, cause a lung point. So these are the take home messages. Number one, findings apply really only to where you're scanning. So to, to do not draw conclusions beyond where you're scanning and scan as many areas, as much uh, of the patient's chest as you can in order to be more sensitive in your examination. To know that a number of findings can rule out pneumothorax, specifically the presence of lung sliding, B lines and lung pulse. Three, if you can't see lung sliding, there are a number of things you can do to try to increase your probability of seeing uh, the sliding. You can decrease the depth. You really should decrease the depth. Use a linear transducer, change to M mode, or apply Doppler. Number four, in the recognize that uh, non-sliding lung with A lines uh, is not diagnostic for pneumothorax. There's, it also has its own differential diagnosis. Next, lung point increases the likelihood of a pneumothorax. Um, again, previously thought to be pathognomonic, although may not entirely be 100%. Um, but more importantly, lung point also helps you estimate the size of pneumothorax. Last but not least, watch out for pitfalls and fakeouts. These are some of the key references that uh, you should be familiar with. And thank you very much for watching.